let's say that's uh, 0.3, 0.2, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0
the parameter space into a subspace for the mean and the subspace for the variance. In that case, I would have basically two independent neural networks I would learn. Or what is also done mostly, especially if you look into standard toolboxes, um, that you will actually only model mu, so you will only actually model the average, the expectation, with a function approximator, while the sigma, so this variance, basically our indicator how much we explore or how little we explore, that this is scheduled externally. So that you have basically some schedule over time, which you tune as an engineer, saying, okay, at the beginning of my learning process, I want to have a high sigma, a high exploration rate, and then over time, I reduce sigma, basically making this bell curve narrow, more narrower, and therefore leading to less exploration and more exploitation. So these are basically the three opportunities, the three possibilities which we have in order to handle these two subfunctions. And as I said, option number three is normally the easiest one and the most common one. Right, so yeah, here are just some more bell curves, uh, basically what I've already sketched there on the blackboard, just indicating that we have these two important parameters, which will basically model and define our stochastic policy. And the main takeaway message is now that we are able to map these continuous actions, so we are not limited anymore to discrete actions, and that with the stochastic policies, we are basically randomly sampling out of this area of actions. However, this figure here, as well as my little sketch here on the blackboard, are one-dimensional sketches. So here we have just considered one continuous action, and as I've mentioned in one of my examples previously, we might have multiple actions which we need to take at the same time, like going on the north-south uh, axis and going on the west-east axis. And in this case, we normally need actions which are, or action functions, which are um, able to map multiple actions at once. And in this case, what we can do, of course, for example, we can just extend our Gaussian uh, probability distribution to a multivariate Gaussian probability distribution, where now our mu, our average, uh, would become a vector out of averages for all the different dimensions, and our sigma would become a capital sigma, which would be basically a covariance matrix, describing the variances of each actions and the covariances between the actions, if they are somehow interconnected with each other. Same parameterization options, of course, uh, are given for these two function approximators, so we can model them independently or together, or schedule them over time. So therefore, what we have here is a, just a two-dimensional example to, to give you some more intuition. So here we would have a bivariate Gaussian distribution for two actions, action one, action two, using the multivariate function from the previous slide. And what we can see here now is that we have a certain probability um, likelihood to take a certain combination of u2 and u1, right? And we can extend this to as many dimensions as we would like to. Of course, here in the two-dimensional example, it is still very uh, easy to depict. But I think it becomes clear that we can extend that to multiple, um, yeah, to multiple dimensions more than two. These functions, so the softmax function for the discrete actions, and Gaussians for the continuous actions, they are just examples. So theoretically, we can use any kind of probability density function describing a stochastic probability of actions giving a state and a parameter vector. Um, so this is just some intuition for you. The Gaussians are normally used as a standard function, so you will also find them very often in practice. But here I would like just to emphasize that these are just examples. So the only thing which we need to do is we have to have this direct relation of actions, likelihoods, and parameters. 
Okay. So what did we do now? We have discussed how our policy looks like. So it's a probability density function. And now the question is, how do we try to modify this probability density function such that we learn something in the sense of making optimal or as best as possible decisions? And in order to describe what are optimal or as best as possible decisions, we need to come up with an objective function because now u and x are continuous quantities. In order to do so, we need to introduce what we call policy objective functions. So basically, uh, objective describing what we actually want to learn. What is our learning task, our learning idea? And in this case, we can, for example, use just a start value based approach. So giving some policy pi with parameters tether, starting in some initial state x, zero, we want to change, we want to learn this parameter vector theta such that this expectation of the initial starting value is maximized, right? So that would be, for example, um, in a classical game scenario, so if you have a chess game or something like that, you want to learn a policy that from the beginning of the game that at the end of the game, you want to have the win, you want to have the highest high score, and so on. Or if you have, for example, an automation task in a um, fabrication plant, you want to be able that at the beginning of a fabrication process to find a decision-making process in order to optimize your fabrication line such that the output of your fab uh, fabric is as high as possible. Alternatively, for continuing tasks where you don't have an episodic end, we could also work with the average reward function. The average reward function looks a little bit fancy here with all these integrals, but what it basically tells us is that given a certain steady state distributions uh, of the states in the learning process, that we basically just want to maximize the average reward over time, right? So if we have a continuing task, that means we do not have an end of the episode. The task will basically just run for an infinitely long amount of time. And given this task, which would run for an infinitely long amount of time, we just want to find a policy which is basically able to maximize the average out of it, which is a good proxy for a task which does not have any end, right? So these would be our objective functions. And now the question is, okay, if these are our objective functions, continuing task, episodic task, and now we want to search for the tethers which will maximize these objectives, the question is how can we do that, right? So we have a policy, we have an objective function, and we want to search for tether optimizing that. So basically this leads us again to an optimization problem, right? So we are searching for tether describing this function that our objective function is becoming optimal, maximal, and finding theta star, so the optimal parameter vector, therefore normally becomes a nonlinear, potentially multidimensional, and also non-stationary problem. Nonlinear because a Gaussian function is a nonlinear function, right? And potentially also um, the reward function and the control plant you're interacting with could be also nonlinear. Secondly, multidimensional, sure, if you have more than one action, two, three, four, five, or what so many actions, that will become also uh, problematic, or if you have more than one parameter in your parameter vector, and non-stationary in that sense that we normally work on these MDPs, which are dynamic environments. And in this problem, of course, uh, in this complex problem, we have again many opportunities to solve it, like heuristics, meta heuristics, sorogaze model optimization, like Bayesian optimization or gradient based techniques. And the thing which I want to highlight here again, I've already pointed it out to you a couple of lectures back, is that if you consider 
this optimization problem here, that this is actually a really hard optimization problem, a global optimization problem in that sense that we have a nonlinear, multidimensional, non-stationary problem, and we want to find an optimal parameter vector trying to solve this problem. And that is actually an unsolved problem of mathematics, right? So if you have a nonlinear function, which is multidimensional and also non-stationary, there is no algorithm of the world which can guarantee you that you will find actually the global best optimum of this parameter vector theta. And the point I want to make here is that we just should keep that in mind that if we apply any of the subsequent algorithms which try to optimize these objective functions, that they work in this really difficult optimization landscape. Of course, it's nonlinear, it's multidimensional in many cases, and non-stationary. So there is a very, like, very big likelihood that our algorithm, which try to solve this optimization task, will only find a local optimum and potentially also a local optimum which is far away from the global optimum, right? However, in practice, due to mostly algorithmic differentiation, we just ignore this and hope for the best. So we are very optimistic learners in that sense. Uh, and we apply gradient descent also here for policy-based learning. So we take our cost function either for the episodic task or for the continuing task. We calculate the gradient of this cost function, or it's not a cost function, but of this objective function. Calculate the gradient with respect to the parameters of the policy and try to update our policy in such a way that we try to extend, increase our rewards, our objective function over time by a very simple gradient descent or gradient ascent optimization because we actually want to maximize J and not minimize J. And in terms of numerical implementation, we normally do this even not with a full batch gradient descent, but just by stochastic gradient descent, by just using a, a small mini batch out of samples in order to find the best local optimum. This here would be this optimistic case where I say, okay, we have a very nice cost landscape, which is quadratic, has a convex shape. So over time, we will be able to meet this local equal global optimum. But as I've mentioned, this is our assumption, our hope that the cost function looks like that. In reality, you will always, or well, very likely, find more something like this. Maybe here's the global optimum. And then, and maybe here, some ISO lines with local minimars here, 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 and here. And depending from where we start, we will basically run into one of the global, uh, one of the local minimars next to our initialization point and very unlikely be able to meet the global minimum here in the middle of the cost shape. Okay, so again, very important takeaway message here from my side. Just consider the difficulty of the optimization problem and that gradient descent methods will typically only lead you to the next local minimum of your problem space and there's no guarantee that this is actually the global optimum. So that's why reinforcement learning, especially using deep reinforcement learning, is also called approximate dynamic programming. So we already had dynamic programming in the discrete problem space where we could show some guarantees that with dynamic programming we are actually able to find optimal decisions in these discrete state and action spaces. And approximate dynamic programming also refers to this, to this characteristic of deep reinforcement learning that we will only approximately find an optimal policy, right? So when we talk about optimal policies, these are optimal policies, not formally optimal, but as optimal as possible, so approximately. Okay. So that was my warning finger again. And now we ignore again what I've said for the next 60 minutes and the other lectures as well. <laughs> 
Um, and what we need to discuss for now is when we use gradient ascent optimization, so we update our parameter along the way of the gradient of the optimization function, we need to calculate the gradient of the optimization function, right? Because we have this, so that's basically just the initialization of our parameters. We can choose the step size, but what we do not have is this, right? So we don't have the gradient. And in order to keep it short and, you know, I don't want to give you like a lengthy derivation, I just give you the result of this and you can actually read about the derivation of how to calculate the gradient of this cost function in the lecture book of Barton and Sutton. Um, but I will give you, a, a, I think, a very intuitive interpretation of the gradient in just two or three minutes. So if we do the derivation, which I skip for time reasons, then we will actually find out that the gradient, so this value which we needed from the previous slide, so in which direction do I need to move myself in the parameter space to optimize my policy, is the expectation of the Q value, Q giving a policy pi for some samples x and u, times the gradient of the policy divided by the policy itself. That is the outcome. Now let's look at the different terms of this policy gradient, or to be precise, of the stochastic policy gradient. First of all, these two functions, right, the policy functions and the derivative of the policy function, is not a big deal. Because we said, we have a policy function which is parameterized by tether, and this will be a differentiable function like the Gaussian, right? So I have an analytical function for this, for the policy, and if I have an analytical function for the policy which is differentiable with respect to tether, I can also calculate this, right? So this entire fraction, we can basically make a checkbox on this because we have an analytical function, we can calculate its first order difference, so, and that's it, right? So this function is basically totally set. What we do not have directly is the Q value, right? So the Q value given a policy is again this estimation, this prediction problem. And we can, however, learn this, right? And we have learned how to learn this already two weeks ago. So basically, if we have a couple of samples, so state action transitions, including rewards and so on, we can basically learn by the techniques which we have already seen so far, like Zaza, how to learn the Q value. And if we have a good estimate of Q of pi using these data samples, plus the analytical solutions of these two functions here in the fraction, we can basically calculate this expectation or approximate this expectation using some data samples without any additional information regarding the plant function, right? So this is still a model-free approach. We need some data for this. We need the analytical functions for the policy. But what we do not need is basically we do not need any information about our plant system, which we are interacting with. For short notation, we can also rewrite this fraction here because we have basically the gradient of a function divided by the function itself. This is basically the definition of the gradient of the uh, logarithmic of this um, function, so here in this function pi. So therefore, in short notation, we can also write the uh, nabla theta of the ln of pi, uh, which is the so-called score function, which will basically give us an information how, yeah, how, how much we will basically improve ourselves uh, in terms of changing our policy in a certain direction. And as I said, derivation, I will not give that in details due to time reasons, but you can basically look it up in chapter 13 of the uh, cited lecture book of Barto and Sutton. It's, uh, it's a very nice three-page derivation, so uh, I can really recommend that if you are not tired in the evening or something, uh, it will help. Um, right, but this is the, the outcome of the derivation. But now let's try to um, interpret this result of the policy gradient a little bit more in detail. 
In order to do so, I have basically colored uh, the two main terms here in, in blue and red. So if we have a, a little bit of view on the bluish one, what do we have here? So we have the Q value. The Q value was basically this information how good or how bad it is to be in a certain state choosing a certain action, right? It's a performance indicator. And this here is the gradient of the policy with respect to its parameter. So we can interpret this multiplication basically as let's try to change the policy in this direction where we expect that our Q values will increase. Right? So let's try to change our policy in such a way that in the future the Q values will become higher. Right? So that's an indicator about the Q values, and that would be basically the direction pointing towards an increased value. And then the red one is basically something like a scaling, something like a weighting, right? So this is basically just the policy taking certain actions being in the state X. So that basically compensates for the probability of taking certain actions more often than others, right? So if you have an action uh, in the policy function, which you already take quite frequently. So that is a, like an action which you really like to do. Then it wouldn't make so much sense to go a very big step again into the, the direction of choosing this action in the future more often, but maybe just to do a little step, trying to not, you know, overtaking this action too much to have a, you know, extremistic kind of action decision scenario. While you might find out that this direction of the policy is associated with an action which you don't take so often, so the probability is low, then it might be an interesting idea to take a larger step towards that, so increasing very much the likelihood of taking this action in the future, because it seems that currently this action is not in your favor, but it seems that it can really help in order to boost your Q values in the future. Yeah, policy gradient, I've already said that. It's not depending on the state distribution. It's just depending on the expectations of the policy. And therefore, I've already mentioned that two or three minutes ago. The policy gradient does not require any information about the model of the MDP, of our Markov decision process, which we're interacting with. Because these two functions or sub-functions are just based on the policy, which we define as engineers on pen and paper or as a program. And the Q values, we have learned many methods in order to estimate that from data, so we don't need to calculate it based on a model. So therefore, we are still in this domain of model-free reinforcement learning. Okay, maybe just to give you some more examples or some more intuition, I would like to dig a little bit deeper into this function. So in this derivative of the policy with respect to theta, to just give you some more intuition that actually this part of the policy gradient, so this fraction part of the policy gradient, can be really calculated analytically, and that the only thing which we need to do with data is to estimate these Q values. In order to do so, uh, as an example, uh, for the score function, I utilize a soft max policy from the previous slide. So that's a soft max policy with linear function approximation. So theta is a function vector, the, the parameter vector, and x tilde again is um, a function from states and actions towards some feature engineering function x tilde. If I now calculate the score function, so the gradient of ln of pi, I first need to cal calculate the ln of this one. So that's very nice. So I can take the ln of this e function. So that's basically getting rid of the exponential function. So what's left is um, theta transpose times x tilde. And as we have then an ln with a fraction, we can utilize basically the ln rules and calculate uh, this fraction with the minus here, and that would be then the ln of this sum, and of course the sum ln 
of this one would be basically just expectations over these feature functions because we basically calculate the gradients and the gradients here of um, theta transpose and theta transpose here would basically lead to this function here, right? So this would be just your feature function, which you will also define analytically, and that would be the expectation of the feature function, which you can also sample out of data. Even more easier, I would say, it comes if you use the univariate Gaussian function. So that's the univariate Gaussian function for a scalar uh, policy with a scalar action. Here, with some very simple linear feature engineering or linear feature uh, mapping. And again, if we calculate the score function, so we put the ln here, then again, the ln will basically compensate for the exponential function here. And we can calculate the score function as a very important part of the policy gradient analytically. And what we just need to choose here is basically our feature functions giving some um, application problem, right? So that's why at this point you also see that exponential functions as part of the policy are useful because due to the score function, we always have this ln here. And if you have some exponential part in your policy function, this will basically cancel out, leading to a very simple policy gradient, which we can then utilize here in our gradient ascent approach. So that's why these exponential function types like a univariate or multivariate Gaussian are very uh, much used here. Okay. So that was just some intuition. Maybe I, I go back to this slide. So I hope that, that with this intuition, uh, you have basically seen that we can basically make a, really this checkbox at this function or these two functions in the uh, friction. Um, and the only thing which we now need to discuss is how to actually get this Q, right? So that's the only thing which is left. And we will discuss that in two variants. The first one will be the Monte Carlo variant, and the second one will be the actocritic approach, right? So this is okay. We have discussed that, and now we will basically take care of different approaches, how to get information and integrate information about the Q. Before we do that, I would like also to summarize a little bit at that point of time the pro and cons of policy and value-based approaches. So like Q-learning from last week. So Q-value is of course very intuitive and the estimated values can be directly associated with performance, good or bad, or better or worse. Uh, we have sample efficient uh, approaches because uh, in the Q-learning approach, we basically had a replay buffer from which we could sample information again and again. And what we have uh, considered today with the policy gradients, that is not possible so far because we have uh, an on-policy learning. And however, for the policy gradients which we have introduced today, there's a seamless integration of stochastic and dynamic policies. So basically, we have exploration as part of the solution. And it is straightforward, applicable to large and continuous action spaces, which is definitely not given here in the Q-value approach, where we have limited ourselves to discrete actions. Um, right? In the action space or in the uh, value-based solution, we would have an additional explicit optimization, which we normally do not want to do. However, I've already mentioned that mutual hassle because we're using gradient-based optimization. That will mean that we will have some suboptimal and local policy risk, which can lead to suboptimal performance. Okay, just a little comparison. And now we basically go back to solutions regarding the Q values. The first approach in order to approximate the Q values will be Monte Carlo with an additional variant, so-called baseline. And then we will discuss vector-critic methods. So, in the Monte Carlo approach, in order to get an estimate regarding Q pi, of course, what we do, you already know that from all the temporal, uh, from all the um, tabular methods and also from Monte Carlo approaches in, in deep reinforcement learning, we basically sample the returns over an episodic task and utilize the sampled return from an episode 
as an estimate of Q, right? So that is Monte Carlo in its pure form. And that means basically we utilize this G, the sampled return as an estimate of Q, and basically put it here in this function. And as this is a sampled uh, value, we basically assume that this sampling is in line with expectation. Uh, and that's why we can basically, in a practical implementation, can get rid of this expectation brackets here and can insert G as a proxy of Q in our gradient ascent formula. The only difference now, which I've not mentioned so far, this is um, discounting. So gamma, again, our discounting factor, we didn't mention that so far uh, to make it not too complicated. But you can basically do this entire derivation of the policy gradients again with the discounting factor. And what's basically coming out of it is that if you sample for long episodes, that the discounting will basically lead to a discounting of G over time and therefore will reduce the gradient steps into a certain direction. Yes. And this approach is called the so-called reinforce approach. Reinforce is a very weird acronym. So it's not in terms of like reinforcement learning, but if you look it up in the original paper from 1993, I guess it was, from Williams, you will basically see that reinforce is a very weird algorithm acronym, like reinforcement learning based on, I don't know, multiple sampled integers and whatsoever. So it's, it's a really weird acronym. So, however, it has been used in literature very much. And the, the, the baseline is here, we take the stochastic policy gradient and we approximate the Q value by the sampled Monte Carlo return. These two combinations, stochastic policy gradient, Monte Carlo based sampling of the Q values by the return, is called the so-called reinforce algorithm, reinforce approach. We can also put this into a pseudo code. And the pseudocode, as you can see, it's, it's quite easy. So it's not so complicated to implement that. We just need to differential pull policy function pi, like our gradient, uh, our Gaussian function. We need a step size, which we choose sufficiently small. We need a parameter vector describing some neural network or something, or a linear function approximator as part of the policy function. And then we just do what we do with Monte Carlo, so we sample a full episode, giving our current policy, which we have so far, utilizing this full episode um, here for an every visit Monte Carlo, we sample G, our return, put G into our policy update, get a new policy, right? So one update from here, from the right-hand side to the left-hand side means that we have changed our policy, we have changed our behavior, how to make decisions. And based on that, we go through another episode with a new policy, which we have updated previously. We again sample data, estimate the return, and so on, right? So that's very easy implementable because it's just a few lines of pseudocode. And the only thing which you need to do here is basically to calculate these gradients here either beforehand so you can really calculate them on pen and paper if it's like a simple policy function like this univariate Gaussian, or if you're using algorithmic differentiation programs like TensorFlow or PyTorch, you can also calculate this based on the uh, functions and possibilities of that program. Okay, so very simple to be implemented and you will also do this next week in the exercise. Let's utilize this reinforce algorithm. So again, this is just an acronym, which is really weird and not a, like the only reinforcement learning algorithm, but just uh, the author of this paper seemed to be uh, having a good time making an algorithm acronym, which basically tries to cover the entire field. And uh, I would like to give you some yeah, application or academic application example, the so-called short corridor problem. What is a short corridor problem? It's quite simple. 
we just have basically um, three states or four states. We have a starting state, we have a goal state, um, and in any state, you can basically choose that you want to go left with a certain probability, or you want to go right with a certain probability. And the second state here, so the first after the starting state, that's a weird one, because if you're in this state, all your actions will be inverted. So if you're staying here and you want to actually go right, you will actually go left. So that's the non-fun making part of this problem. And it turns out that if you calculate the cost function over certain probabilities of going right, so actually you want to go right, right? So you start here, you want to end here. So actually you would like to go right all the time if this special state would not be here. And what you will actually find out, if you would go right all the time, of course, the, the cost function or the, the optimization metric here would completely go into the seller because what would happen is you go right, then you're here, you want to go right again, but this is inverted, so you actually go left. So what is happening? You go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, nothing happens. You stay here all the time, and your reward or your quality function j basically goes completely into the seller because you will be rewarded a minus one per time step. The same if the probability of going right would go to zero, because that would mean that in the starting state, you would go left all the time. Here's a barrier, so you would not leave the state because you would just stay in the state, so this would be, of course, also not optimal. And it turns out that at, what is that? I think 60% likelihood going to the right-hand side is actually optimal because that gives you a certain chance that in the first time step you go right, then in the second time step, you again sample. Eventually, you want to go left, but as this action is flipped, you actually go right. And then you sample again from your policy. And if you're lucky, you again sample that you want to go right, which is now working, and then you have the gold state. So that's why, if you calculated a probability of going to the right action with 60% is actually optimal. And you couldn't do this, like finding this optimal stochastic policy. Um, in a epsilon greedy way, as we have done it with Q values last week. But you really would need to have this optimal stochastic policy, which delivers you much better values than an epsilon greedy technique going right or left. Important here is also that if you implement the reinforced algorithm, the learning rate alpha, so we have basically here three learning rates, that this learning rate is an important technical parameter. The bluish line is a comparably high step rate. So alpha is 2 to the power of minus 12, which is much higher than 2 to the power of minus 14 or 2 to the power of minus 13. And obviously, this is not leading to the optimal policy here. Only if your step size is sufficiently small you will eventually converge at the optimal theoretical value or very close to the optimal theoretical value. And the reason for that is that if you have a large step size, what will happen is something like, I would call it chattering. So your parameters, they do not approach a steady state value, but if the step size is too large in terms of the parameter steps, you will change your parameters a little bit to the left. Maybe your step size was too large. And then in the next step, you consider, ah, I, I was going a too large step in, in my parameter space. I need to go the other direction again. But then your step size is still very large, and you just basically flip back and forth of the optimal parameter set. So let's say you have a, just a scalar tether, and that is j. And let's consider we are in the best case where we have a quadratic convex optimization scheme, which is wrong because we want to optimize something. So it would be like this. So actually, you want to go here, which would be theta star. So you either go this direction if you start here, or you want to go this direction, you're starting here. And if your step 
size is too large, what can happen is that let's say you are here, you're just jumping back and forth, right? So you're jumping from an suboptimal parameter set to another suboptimal parameter set back and forth. That's what I would call the chattering effect. And only if your step size is sufficiently small, you will basically able to make these small steps into the theoretical optimal parameter set. So therefore, this slide should be basically just a yeah, example plus a hint that the step size alpha is an important technical parameter. Um, here for a to the power or alpha 2 to the power of minus 30, we actually seem to be able that after a thousand episodes, we are very close to the theoretical optimal value, which is this dashed line. And what we can see here is that if you make the step size even smaller by one order of magnitude, we can see that eventually, after maybe another 500 or 1,000 episodes, that the greenish line will be also at the optimal learning level. But we can see that the step size is so slow that the convergence rate is decreased, right? So we need longer to train, we need longer to find the optimal value, and um, therefore it's always about finding the best possible trade-off between a small step size for the fine-tuning of the parameters and a large step size for trying to converge to the optimal decisions or best possible optimal decisions as quick as possible. Okay, what you can also see here from the slide is that um, this learning curve is quite noisy, right? So we see these spikes here, also here the blue ones. So um, it seems that the learning process is not yeah, deterministic, of course it's not deterministic, but it's also not certain and therefore subject to a high learning variance. And we have already discussed that with Monte Carlo in the tabular case, that Monte Carlo really takes long to learn something and that it's also of high variance. So there's a high probability that if you redo your experiment, you will get different results. And in order to reduce this high variance, so this, this chattering of the learning curve, uh, we can do a little trick and add something to the reinforced algorithm. And this addition to the reinforced algorithm is called a so-called baseline. What is a baseline? It's basically uh, this B. We will discuss in two or three minutes what B is typically, and then I think it becomes much more intuitive why this baseline approach can help. But what we basically do is we modify our gradient of the cost function of our policy and add this baseline here to the Q value before the gradient of the score function or the, the score function gradient. And important is that this baseline needs to be a function which is independent of the actions. So the baseline is only allowed to be dependent on the state. And this baseline, as the name already says, this function, will give you a baseline evaluation on how good or how bad your current policy is in comparison to something else, right? So the Q value with respect to the policy pi would be the performance of your policy and you compare it to the baseline function, so basically just a comparison metric, right? So it would be like, um, if you are like a sprinter in track and field um, and your action value or state action value would be like, okay, I'm able to make the uh, 100 meters and 9 seconds 50 or something, that would be the absolute value. And then you can comp compare this value in relative terms to some competitors, like maybe another guy in the field is able to run the 100 meters in 9 minutes, uh, nine seconds and 700 milliseconds. So that would be then the relative difference of your performance with respect to somebody else in this track and field example. 
The interesting thing is, if we add this baseline and assume that the baseline is only dependent on the state and not on the action, that we can actually show that if we calculate the gradient of the cost function or the reward function here, that the expectation of the part, so if I basically calculate, calculate this minus b times gradient of the score function, that this is zero. So you need to do two or three more intermediate steps in order to see that this is actually zero because this term will be actually a zero uh, if you calculate it out. So that means that this expectation of the gradient is untouched, is not changed, if the um, baseline is only dependent on the states. And that means that this baseline can be helpful in order to reduce the variance, as we will see in a minute, but it will not lead to a bias of the policy. It helps you to learn quicker, it helps you to learn less uncertain, but it will not lead to a bias and therefore to a higher risk of suboptimal actions. And with this baseline, what we can basically now do is, we can change our Monte Carlo policy updates. The only difference now is here in the parents of this. Here's our sampled return. And what we do is we compare the sampled return to the baseline value. That is still very abstract. Just on the next slide, we will see how we normally define this baseline. Here for the uh, actual time, that could be any function which is just depending on the state describing a certain performance. Okay? And we will compare the performance Again, our policy, which has been here sampled and characteristic by the return in the Monte Carlo context. Okay, very abstract. And now let's make this baseline function more specific. The typical choice of the baseline function is that we just choose the baseline as a state value function, right? The state value is just depending on x, not on u. So it fulfills this requirement that the baseline function is independent of the actions. And if we insert now the baseline function as a state value in our gradient calculation here, this becomes very intuitive. If you look at this parenthesis, this basically means if you take a certain action u in a state x, this is worse or better compared to the state value just following this policy, right? So you compare a certain action in a given state against the policy which is currently active. And you can find out that this state action pair is either better than your current policy, so that would mean that this difference here becomes a positive value. So that would basically indicate, okay, Let's try to move the policy in this direction because this seems to be good or better. Or it turns out that the state action value is lower than the state value, so lower than your current policy. That would indicate a negative finding, like, okay, let's don't go in this direction, let's go in the other direction because this is decreasing my performance in relative terms and this is increasing likely my performance. And this difference here, this relative difference, are now becoming smaller values. As I mean numerical values, right? So if that is a Q value, which has maybe very high values in terms of numerical values, and this is the state value, which can be also very high as a numerical value, the difference between the two will be a small number. So therefore, the numerics behind, and therefore the variance of the learning process is increased or is supported, because this difference basically just leads to smaller and more distinct steps as if we would only utilize the Q value as in the reinforced algorithm. And this difference between the two value functions has also a very important um, name. We will utilize it a lot, not only today, but also in the subsequent lectures. And that is called the so-called advantage function, right? So this is this metric of how much better is it to take a certain action in comparison to my current policy, right? So we compare what is our option here against what we do normally 
parameterized by our policy point. So the advantage or disadvantage, is if it would be a negative number, in comparison to what we have already learned. Right? Um, so let's make an example. Um, you are in a supermarket and um, you're searching for the cheapest uh, noodle uh, sortiment there. Uh, and maybe your previous policy was always to take the noodle which cost you like one euro. So your value would be one euro. And now you reconsider your options and eventually you see a pack uh, in the supermarket which only costs 80 cents. So your status, you're standing in front of the supermarket shelf and you choose the noodle pack which is uh, 20 cents cheaper. So in this case, yeah, your advantage would be basically minus 20 cents, but let's say it's basically your win would be plus 20 cents, right? So this would be your advantage in this case. So interpretation, I've already said that value difference taking arbitrary actions and thereafter follow, following policy pi. So basically how much better we are in comparison to our baseline. And therefore we can rewrite the reinforce algorithm using the baseline addition here with the advantage function because that is now yeah, basically this difference here between the Q value and the normal state value. However, this extension of the baseline to the reinforce algorithm does not come for free. Because if you have a look at these two equations here, um, we have already discussed that we need a Q value estimator, which we can sample from the Monte Carlo approach. But now we also need an estimator of the state values, right? Because we need to calculate basically here the V values. And if we do so, uh, that basically means that we need a second function approximator. And the second function approximator, which is again parameterized by parameters W as last time. So last time we have used W as a function approximator for the state values or action values. And today we are using the second function approximator as a proxy, as a function approximator proxy in order to directly calculate this delta here. So basically the difference, the advantage between the sampled Q values via Monte Carlo and the V values from this function approximator. Right, so in this temporal difference approach basically. So therefore the baseline approach does not come for free. We need the second set of estimator functions and this will be basically used in order to calculate the state value functions to yeah, calculate here the advantage for the baseline gradient descent approach. Not for free, but it's also nice in that sense that if you have the V values available, you can of course also ask uh, your function approximator how good or how bad it is to be in a certain state, so that can give you additional information, which you do not have if you just learn the policy. If you compare then these two variants against each other, um, again, on this short corridor problem with this flipping state, we can now see that with this baseline where we use the advantage function, that the learning process is much um, increased in terms of speed because the advantage can be used in order to guide our learning. The baseline can be used to reduce the variance of the learning process. If we reduce the learning of the variance process, we can actually increase the step size so we are learning quicker. And at the end, we need much less episodes in comparison to the reinforced algorithm without baseline in order to get an optimal policy or near optimal policy. Okay. So far, any questions? Seems to be not the case. Maybe then with the pseudo code, I would like to point out one thing here. Um, that the Monte Carlo policy gradient baseline is an on-policy online algorithm. 
So that means that we will directly learn a policy parameterized by Tether and we will directly utilize the data samples from the episode in order to do the sampling of G, calculate the gradients and so on. And that means if the episode has terminated and we have processed all these data tuples, we will discard them for the next episode. So that is a big difference to our DQN algorithm from last week where we had a data buffer where we could store the data for some time and reutilize the data in this experience replay approach and therefore trying to squeeze out as maximum as possible information out of the data. Here, due to this online on policy approach, that is not possible. We always need fresh data because it's on policy. So this data needs to be associated with the same policy. And once we have changed the policy, this data is not associated anymore with this new policy and needs to be discarded. And therefore, this on policy approach, in contrast to the DQN from last week, is normally considered not so sample efficient because the samples are discarded in a short amount of time. So we normally need more data. We need to train longer in order to get similar results in contrast to an algorithm which is able to utilize experience replay. So that's an important difference between the two algorithm classes. And uh, that already gives us maybe some intuition that it would be nice to take a um, policy gradient approach, which is able to work on continuous actions, but to add up this idea of experience replay buffer in order to be more sample efficient. And this will already motivate a very important algorithm class, which we will introduce next week, which will basically fuse together what we have learned about DQN last week and what we see here in this online on policy learning today. Okay. In order to go there, uh, as an intermediate step, we will introduce the ectocratic methods, which is basically just a very small addition to Monte Carlo policy gradient approaches with this baseline. So what we have seen from Monte Carlo policy with baseline is that we will learn an unbiased policy gradient because the baseline is not changing the expectation of the gradient. And however, it will learn slowly because in this episodic fashion, we need to wait until the entire episode is finished. Then we can just utilize the data once, needs to discard it, and that's it. And what we can actually not do is we cannot learn in this step-by-step -step fashion, right? So that's very unfortunate if we have maybe very long episodes where we would have to wait very long until we can process the data, or if it's a continuous or quasi-continuous process where there is no episodes or no real episodes, then this would be also not good. And in order to get rid of these problem, especially slow learning and the requirement of full episodes, what we actually will now do is we will uh, allow us to estimate a so-called critic. And this critic is basically directly estimating the advantage, right? So previously we have estimated the value and the critic will now basically try to directly estimate the advantage. The advantage here would be of course the difference between the Q value and the V value. And this would actually require us, theoretically, to use two function approximators or two intermediate function approximators. The one would be for the Q values and the other one would be for the V values. And we could utilize any prediction tool which we have learned so far as TD0 or LSTD in order to do there. And if we do so, if we directly learn about the advantage, then we could basically update that step by step. We would not need to wait for the entire episode for V. And this would be, of course, uh, very nice. However, the disadvantage here, as I've mentioned, is we would have two different value estimators. However, we can get rid of that. For example, if you're using the TD error, so uh, um, delta here as the TD error uh, for the successor state and the current state, and we calculate the expectation of the TD error over time, and compare it to the V value, so we basically calculate the advantage value here, 
then we can basically find that the TD error, so the TD0 error to be precise, that this is identical, the expectation of the TD error to the advantage function. So that basically means if we utilize the TD approach and directly learn about the TD error, that can be used as the advantage function. So therefore, this equivalence, so this equivalence basically motivates that we can use TD learning as a step-by-step -step learning approach to combine this with this idea of policy gradients to get a step-by-step -step policy gradient method which will estimate the advantage or the uh, TD error over time. Therefore, in order to do policy gradients, what we can now do is instead of the advantage, we can introduce the TD error because we have shown here that the TD error and the advantage is equivalent in expectation. And therefore, we just need one function parameter set because the TD error can be just estimated from the state values of the current state and the successor state. And therefore, we just need one parameter set W and not two parameter sets W. And what we get from that is this very famous vector-critic structure in a simplified way, so very generic, uh, but I, I'm already showing it here because we will utilize this vector-critic structure a lot in the subsequent lectures and today. So what is the intuition behind? It is basically that we have a critic which is evaluating the TD error or the advantage function. So that is basically telling the agent how good or how bad it is to, to take certain actions in comparison to the current policy. So that would be like, a, let's call it maybe a sports commentator which sits in the stadium and basically tells, okay, if the player goes this way, this would be better than what he normally does. And that would be basically just a commentator telling the actor what is bad or worse than usual options. And with this information about how well the agent did in the past and how bad or worse or better certain actions are, we can utilize this in the actor in order to improve the policy. Right? So the actor is a policy making function and the critic is an evaluation function as an intermediate solution to do policy gradients on the actor. And for that, we need two functional approximators, normally artificial neural networks, one with a parameter set tether and one with a parameter set w. And that is a very typical approach, as you can, yeah, if you are a sports guy, uh, right? So that would be your trainer basically telling you what you did good or bad in the past. And that would be you. And you basically try to combine the information from the trainer and your own expectations, your own information in order to get better. Sure. No, so, so the critic has no extra information, right? So the critic will give you information about the advantage. And the advantage is just an information basically telling us if you do a certain action, how much better or worse is that action in comparison to the current policy, right? So you don't need any outside information it will be just an estimate of relative improvement or worsening your policy in comparison to what you already do, right? So it's not like a, the critic does not have any like world knowledge. It's just comparing action probabilities against the outcomes of the policy which you already have utilized so far, okay? So that's why the critic is also, it is just learned from data, right? So it's just learned from the TD error, which we have seen that we can calculate the TD error via data, so via state, action, and reward transitions. 
And therefore, the critic is also completely data-driven, right? It is not requiring any model knowledge, and it's basically just a relative metric in comparing actions against the current policy. Okay, and I find that this actor critic method, it's, it's really like a, a natural kind of um, learning how we would also learn as a human, right? So the critic would be basically an experience-based implicit model without having the model knowledge, but something which I have learned from data, so from past observations, telling you, okay, I've always solved a certain task in the past in this and this way, and I'm not happy with this. And in the back of my mind, I have an alternative approach. And based on my data, based on my observations of the past, I think that this alternative is better by so and so much percent in comparison to my usual solution way. Right? So that is what you would also do like in your own learning process. That if you learn to, um, I don't know, drive a, drive a curve with your car, and you want to be as fast as possible, maybe. 10 times you have taken the curve very steeply and then eventually find out, okay, it could be maybe good to take like an extra way, finding this ideal line through the curve, and that could be then derived from this critic, and this actor would be then the execution of your actions over time. Okay. We will see that we will utilize the structure of the actor critic quite frequently. Next week we will also introduce two other algorithms which are based on this actor critic structure and um, yeah we will we will really see it a lot um, the nice thing is also that during the learning process that this critic gives you some information about your performance right so the actor just maps states to actions right we are in a state and we get an action but that does not tell you how good this action is or how bad this action is. For this, you can utilize the critic because the critic will basically tell you, okay, if you take this action in the certain state, how good or how bad is that? And this can also help you uh, during the learning process to get an, at least an intuition how far your learning is already. If you see that the Q values are very low or the, the advantage is still very high, so you are still able to learn something, that gives you an intuition that, okay, the learning seems to be still ongoing. If you find that the Q values are quite high already and that the advantage is quite low, that gives you an indication that, ah, it seems that the learning has already progressed a lot and I might be close to finding the optimal or near optimal solution. Okay. So with that in, our, in the back of the mind, what we can basically do now is with just little tweaks, with little changes to the reinforce algorithm with baseline, we can come to the actor critic algorithm with TD0 targets, where we have two functions. One function is for the state values, and one function is for the policy function. With the state value approximator, so that would be the same approximator v hat, just evaluated for two different states, we can calculate the TD error or the advantage. This TD error can then be used in order to improve the critic. And as we have seen, the TD error is also equivalent to the advantage in expectation. So we can add it here to the score function and utilize the TD error in order to guide our policy search, trying to improve our policy towards decisions which increase the Q value. And the nice thing is now that this algorithm is based on this temporal difference, so simple step bootstrapping, and therefore we can also apply it in an online learning in a step-by-step -step fashion, which is not required on full episodes. However, the standard actor critic based on the advantage function here is still an on-policy learning, right? As soon as we have changed our policy from here to here, we discard our last data sample. So we don't reutilize data samples in this replay buffer scheme. So that's also not data efficient. And therefore, we are still having an online 
on policy algorithm, which we are going to extend now, next week also to an offline and uh, of policy learning algorithm. However, as an extension for today, this TD error here, that's the TD0 target, right? So we just bootstrap after the first transition from k to k plus 1. And you already know the story. We could also exchange that with one of our many other TD targets. We could utilize end step bootstrapping. We could utilize the lambda returns. Or we could also use eligibility traces to basically change that in the actor critic way. These two ones, the end step bootstrapping and the uh, lambda return approach, would basically just change this line here, right? For the TD error. So instead of the TD0 error, we would put in here TD end step or TD lambda. And the eligibility traces with the backward view, where we do not need to wait until we get actually these n steps or lambda steps return, which can be adding additional delays to the uh, problem, that will actually lead to a certain additional change here of the actor critic approach, where we would actually also trace the eligibility traces over time for w and theta. So in this case here for the TD lambda targets with eligibility traces, the algorithmic um, changes would be a little bit more heavier. But yeah, we have already discussed about eligibility traces that this would be basically filtering our changes of the actor and the critic over time in order to get a more smooth and also recursive learning progress. Okay, so the rest is just the usual summary, which is for your home reading. So what have we learned today? We have learned about stochastic policies, which are parameterized by analytical functions, giving a parameter set. We have learned about the policy gradient, basically telling us how we can change the policy in a gradient ascent approach in order to optimize our decision-making progress. And we have seen here with the Monte Carlo approach and now with the actor critic approach based on temporal difference learning, how we can put this into an algorithm which is online and on policy. So it just utilizes the most recent data samples uh, and that can be extended to continuous actions. That is the biggest change for today. Besides that, exploration is now part of the stochastic policy, right? So here in this policy function, whatever this function is, like a Gaussian, that would include exploration, so that's why we do not have any separate exploration steps here, because asking our policy what to do would be already drawing a number from a random process or from a random function. Okay, any questions? Darren. Okay, so if the critic is learning uh, faster or slower than the critic, that's a very good question. Um, often in some of the toolboxes which you are going to use, you will find that critic and actor actually have the same learning rate, but this is more or less due to programming laziness. Normally it makes sense to let the critic learn a little bit faster than the actor, because if the actor changes quite quickly, or quicker than the critic, then you would have the problem that the critic is basically lagging behind the actor and gives you performance indications which would be, you know, already old, not fitting to the current actor uh, parameterization. And therefore, a typical um, parameterization is let's have the learning rate of the cri critic a little bit higher than the learning rate of the actor to ensure that the critic is always a critic of the current policy and not a lagging version of it. Yeah, but good question. Yes. 
Yes, so that's also a very good question, right? So um, let's maybe go here. So for the advantage as part of the critic, we need to learn about the values, right? And these value functions are parameterized by an, a function approximator like an artificial neural network using TD0 or n step TD or whatsoever. And if this critic function or this v-value function is completely off, so it does not, by structural problems, does not fit the values of your true value function. So there might be a big structural difference between the true value function, which you do not have access to, and the estimated value function, that will, of course, negatively impair your learning progress, right? So um, that would be like um, you are trying to make a bank investment, like on the stock market, and you ask like some colleagues, okay, do you have like advice for me which stock share should I buy because that has a very good like outcome or very good outlook in the future to raise my income or my, my, my money on the bank account. And so you ask 10 people and they just give you like 10 bad advices, right? So they say like you buy stock shares from this company because it's like highly probable that this will go through the roof in the next couple of months. Then you buy that because you are basically relying on the advice from your critics, from your peers. And then it turns out that this advice was completely crappy and the company goes bankrupt, right? So you have heard on the critic, your colleagues, bad advice, bad value function, not accurate, wrong decision, right? So um, therefore your question is like really good because it indicates that two things has to fit together. We need a good value estimator here for the values such that the critic can become as accurate as possible. And for uh, the policy, of course, the policy function needs to be also fitting to my problem. If I have, uh, for example, a policy function which is um, not covering the entire action space, or if the uh, policy function is um, badly parameterized in terms of exploration and exploitation, that will not fit together. And it is very likely that you will learn a policy which is not good, or it could be also that the policy is not converging at all, that you basically see over time that the, the performance so time steps and uh, performance value, that the agent is not learning something and basically just, you know, does not learn how to optimize the problem because something is off. That could be the critic which is off, that could be the actor which is off, that could be other technical parameters like learning rates which are not considered correctly. So there could be many reasons that the learning process is not converging to uh, suitable performance levels and one of them, to come back to your question, could be that the critic is off. Other questions? Okay. Another example with the critic would be also that you ask five other students which course to take, and they give you advice to take not this course, then of course the critic would be wrong, for obvious reasons, and you would make maybe a wrong decision to actually not take this course, right? So that would be unfortunate. So, you know, so, so the critic is like asking friends, and if these friends give, give you false advice, then it is likely that this will negatively affect your personal decisions. And the critic is something like your friends, but in this case, you need to learn your friends and teach them how to do better by telling them, choose this course next time. Okay, so if there are no further questions, uh, we are already a little bit over time. Then I would thank you for your attendance and we see us in next week 